The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. everybody, welcome to Ask for Candy, where we talk about healing, self-care, love, sex, relationships, and what it takes to be amazing on the daily. Who I am is CandiceHarperLoveCoach.com, and my purpose with this podcast is to create healthy romantic relationships all around the world through self-love, soul connections, and sweetness. But before we get to that, we are we are normally here with our production partner, Solivity Magazine, but we're not going completely live tonight. So by the time you're hearing this, we did not have a live social media broadcast like we normally do. Everybody's gearing up for the vice presidential debates. Whenever you're listening to this, this was recorded on Wednesday, October 7th, two months before the presidential elections. And we're not going to get into politics, but I myself am very excited about uh, tonight's vice presidential debates. And hopefully by the time that you're hearing this, if you're hearing this in you know the months ahead, there will be good news and there will be a good outcome to these debates. That's all the politics that I am going to probably ever talk about on this show. But I just wanted you guys to know why we're not live on social media. Anyway, you're listening on Anchor or iTunes or Spotify or iHeartRadio or one of the many outlets where we uh, broadcast this podcast. So you don't care whether we're live on social media. You're just happy to be here, I hope. Also, don't forget to subscribe. You can still subscribe to watch us at Solivity.com for our normal live broadcast. And please subscribe on Anchor because that's how we make a podcast money. And on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, all those other good places. You can also email us, askforcandypodcast at gmail.com. If there's anything I say through the course of the show and you're like, Candy, what in the hell are you talking about? Or you're like, that really, really hits home for me. Or you're like, I just want to talk to you about things. I would love it if you email me, askforcandypodcast at gmail.com. Leave your comments, ask your questions. I sometimes will use whatever you ask as topics for the show. I will sometimes, you know, create questions out of, out of your comments or use your questions in future shows to give me more things to talk about. So you're 100% welcome to do that. For those of you who always listen in, you know that for almost nine years, I have been a relationship coach, a workshop facilitator, and now a professional matchmaker with Talkify Dating Service. And this is me living into my purpose, my purpose of loving myself unconditionally and inspiring others to do the same using their romantic lives as a portal, an inspiration, a catalyst to their highest self. And, you know, even tonight's topic is very aligned with the idea of of living in your purpose and finding that healing and getting to a point where you can just live out loud. Do you know that through no support whatsoever, and I'm not saying this like a victim because I don't think that it is the onus is on the people around us to support us in our endeavors, especially when they don't understand. It's like T.D. Jake says, you know, when you, you, the giraffe and the turtle, when you're a giraffe and you're built to be tall, you can't expect the turtle to see things from your perspective. So when we have big dreams, big ideas, big visions for ourselves, the expectation that the people around us be able to see, understand, and support us in those visions is too much of an expectation because they can't see from our view. Now they have their things that they get to be giraffes around, that they get to be tall around. It's not a hierarchy. It's not one's better than the other. But I say all of this to say, becoming a matchmaker, a relationship coach, um, you know, just living into this purpose, uh, doing my epic circle every Monday night with the group and, and encouraging women to love themselves, understand themselves, be in self-awareness, uh, being able to touch people in that way is something that I, I, 
I couldn't have imagined would be so possible that I could be making my living at it, that I could be living the life that I want to live based on doing this, that I could love my work so much that it doesn't feel like work. Like I never stop working because I just, I love it so much. It doesn't feel like I'm working. And I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this to say that if you have anything that you feel purposeful around and you're in the face of no agreement, meaning that maybe you have a family that just doesn't understand, doesn't get it, um, you know, doesn't, if they see things one way, I very much come from a working class family. And so success means getting a job, making a certain level of income. And, you know, if you're a woman in the family, marrying somebody who can support and provide for you and also doing what you want to do, but for mainly marrying somebody who can support and provide for you and them being successful, you know, traditional, a traditional home. And there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But sometimes when you have a dream, when you have a vision and you want to live into your purpose and you want to be different than what your tribe, your family, your people have told you that you need to be, it can be very disheartening when they don't understand and they don't know how to support you and they don't know what to say. Now, that's not to say that they, they've never given me support because that's not true. But, um, you know, in in so many instances, instances in this journey, I have been in the face of no agreement, uh, no understanding, uh, you know, maybe even belittling. Even when I used to work in television, you know, thinking that it wasn't that serious of a thing, it wasn't a big deal until I made it to a certain success level. And that's just the way it is, right? But I say all of that because I am very present to, at this moment and this day, just living my dream. And as I'm saying this, my dog just farted and it smells like hell. <laughs> it smells so bad <laughs> in my room where my dog is laying at my feet. Yeah, I'm living the dream <laughs> with this dog fart cloud around me. But yeah, I, I've never been um, so happy in my entire life. And even when I, you know, even though I'm a relationship coach and I, I definitely advocate for great relationships, I do think that that's what it's all about. You know, what has, has you know, getting in relationship with myself and being connected to my purpose and being in this space right now is actually more fulfilling than anything that I have ever done. Any relationship I've ever had, any job achievement that I had until I found my purpose, um, anywhere I've ever gone, like there's just nothing that has felt more fulfilling than being able to say that I make a living. I make a living. I survive and now thrive because for a long time I was barely surviving. <laughs> And then I moved to survival and now moving to thriving, like I'm moving into thriving in a great way. And um, to be able to say that is just the most happy, fulfilling thing that that I just, yeah, I'm overwhelmed by being able to say that right now. And so matching, matchmaking and relationship coaching, they are my zone of genius. I mean it when I say that. It is my zone of genius. I've never felt more happy and comfortable to be doing anything in my life. Like it just, it brings me joy. I can't wait for it. I wake up ready to do it. I love people. I love, you know, dealing with people when it comes to their relationships. Even when I get frustrated with them, it's only because I so much want to see them, you know, be happy and in a loving relationship with themselves and therefore with a relation, in a relationship with others. I just had to thank you for indulging me. It's just us tonight. You know, Brian's not with me, like I said, because we're not live. He's going to be back next week. But thank you for indulging me in this moment of just relishing. I'm relishing right now. And hopefully you can enjoy the relish. So like I was saying, matchmaking and relationship coaching are my zone of genius. And the best part about it is that week to week, I get to grow and learn as I interact with hundreds of people around the most intimate part of their lives. I get to take people on their journey from caterpillar to butterfly, unhappy with their love lives to ecstatic. I get to teach people how to get out of their own way and tap into love as a limited resource. And most importantly, I get to be a part of what supports healthy beginnings and sustainably healthy relationships. I get to be the cause of self-love, soul connections, and sweetness. What more could you possibly want? 
I get to be the cause of all those things. So part of what I do, mostly, you know, when I do this podcast, I talk a lot about dating and I talk about uh, the matchmaking side of things. And because we're having an intimate little show, just me, you and my farting dog, um, I want to talk about the work, the the personal work tonight. I want to talk about the relationship with self and how we mend the relationship with self. I also want to talk about how we create with our words, our beliefs, our thoughts, and how they give rise to our actions and create our reality, right? So I want to talk about the coaching end of things and what I do as far as my coaching is concerned and how my coaching practice is growing like crazy. As a matter of fact, if you want to be matched Um, For coaching sessions with me, you can go to mywellbeing.com and search for me. And, um, you know, I charge on a sliding scale doing coaching, uh, hypnotherapy, rapid transformational therapy, which are really, really great sessions for things that you want to transform in your life. Mainly I work around love, but, you know, it can work around a lot of things. If you have body image issues, um, you know, uh, worrying about being able to live into your purpose or get aligned with yourself, feeling out of sorts, feeling depressed through all this pandemic stuff, can't get the emotions together, uh, overeating, all of that stuff, you know, it all ties in together. So, that's a little side commercial. I do. I want to talk about my coaching. I want to talk about what that is, what I do, um, you know, give people sort of an understanding of that. Cause I usually don't really talk about what that is. And right now I am adding a new tool to my coaching toolbox that I, it actually is one of the things that started me on my own growth journey, you know, over a decade or so ago, maybe even a couple decades ago. Um, And, you know, at the time when I first was introduced to this, it really changed everything. And last Monday in the Epic Circle, you guys know that listen regularly that every Monday night I do a group coaching from six to eight Eastern Um, every every yeah, every Monday I did a work session with them and it's the work And it was invented by uh, Byron Katie, she calls herself, and most people call her Katie. And it's free to do the work with her, which is fantastic. You can do it online. She's very sharing with it. She's very open with it and allows anybody to use it. You can do it on your own. And I've done both, where I've done it on my own and I've done it with groups and I've facilitated it myself. I do think that it's amazing when you do it in a community. I think that it's just, you know, so transformative. But it is possible to do it by yourself as well. But, you know, my invitation is that if you want to come and do it with me, with my group, you're welcome to do that. But I want to talk about it tonight because it's one of the tools, like I said, that I'm adding to my toolbox, along with the hypnotherapy, along with my own curriculum, which is the EPIC curriculum, Enough Peaceful, Illuminated and Courageous, or Empowering Practices for Intimate Connections. There's a lot of uh, possibilities for that anagram, but it's all of those things. But this tool um, is really special to me because it, it's such quick transformation. And I'm actually going to break it down in this particular podcast. So you could actually do it along with me if you so chose to. But I want to talk about like certain thought patterns we have, certain ways that we approach like love and things like that. Like, you know... I'm a big believer and I say this all the time and I just said it earlier that our thoughts, our beliefs, the words that we use, those are the things that create our experience. And, you know, when we want to have a good love life experience, it just doesn't serve for us to have bought into all the negativity there is in the world around relationships. Like the insistence that you know, that everyone's going to cheat and people just aren't honest and it's manipulation. And the only way to get through it is through manipulation and that relationships are hard work. I hate it when people say that relationships are hard work. So, you know, I don't like to argue with people who are currently in relationships because they're like, you know, what do you know? You're single. But I've been in long-term relationships. I've been in, you know, I was in a 13-year relationship. I was in a four-year relationship. I was in two, three-year relationships. So, you know, and I always say this too, relationship status is just where you are on your journey. Anybody who's in a relationship right now is just a death, a divorce, or an infidelity away from being single. And anybody who's single is just an engagement 
a promise, a commitment from being in a couple. So, you know, it, it really has no bearing on, you know, how much you know and how much you can, you can grow and learn or anything like that. What it has to do with is, you know, how adept are you at self-relationship and how do you speak of love and how do you speak your experience into existence? What do you believe about love? If I go into something like a relationship believing that it's got to be hard work, then hell yeah, it's going to be hard work, right? So it's important that we that we take agency over our thoughts and our beliefs so that we don't have to be slaves to the animal brain. Because how do I react when I think something's going to be hard work? You know, if, if I if I go into it and, you know, generally speaking, people go into a relationship, honeymoon period, they're in love, they're happy. But the moment something breaks down, the moment that there's a communication issue, the moment that it's not quite what they think it should ideally be all the time, then the uncertainty sets in and then the snowball begins and either they make choices that clear whatever's going on or they make choices that further the negative snowballing. But without the skills and the awareness to understand that it doesn't have to be hard work, usually people make the choice that that makes it hard work. (laughs) And whether that means having a breakdown with someone and not communicating or, um, you know, talking to other people about what's going on in your relationship, you know, having I've done that where I've just complained, complained, complained about a relationship I was in to a best friend or a group of friends, which is, you know, toxic, so toxic to a relationship to just be sitting around talking about the person that you're with in a negative way and feeding into all of your ideas, your thoughts, beliefs that you feel are so true. And then reacting to that person based on all the thoughts and feelings and beliefs that you you've decided are so true about that person, right? Then you get all the people around you against them, You know, I have a very good friend who I love so dearly. And I remember when we were younger, probably for at least a couple of decades, she talked so badly about her boyfriend. Everybody who loved her was mad at him all the time. And even now he can't go anywhere without getting a side eye from somebody because that's the, you know, that's what she put together. That's, you know, the experience she created by how she talked about him. So that's the great thing about this tool, because anything that has us question our thoughts and beliefs. Anything that has us wonder if the thoughts and beliefs that we're having are serving us and actually examine them rather than just go into autopilot. You know, I've talked before about how our feelings aren't facts, even though we think that they are. You know, we have all of these, um, one of my, my coaching clients who's in my group. I love her so much. She talks a lot about boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. She loves that word boundaries. And, you know, to me, boundaries translates to all the things that I put in place to keep people at a certain distance because I've been hurt, because I've dealt with things, because things have befallen my life. I got to put all these things in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. And so I got to set my boundaries with people. Now, that's not what it always means in all cases. In this particular case, that, that's a lot of what it means. And usually when women are talking about the boundaries that they need to set, that's what they're talking about. How do I need to control the future so whatever happened in the past doesn't happen again? And so that's just such a counterintuitive way of going about it because ultimately our real self, our true self wants to experience great love. Our real self, our true self wants to just be able to be ourselves and be authentic and be in a relationship that has openness and communication where we can be in our feminine energy and get excited and, you know, be sexual and be not sexual when we don't want to be and and have intelligent conversations and connection and someone who understands us. But how can we do that with all the boundaries in the way, right? The boundaries are informed by these beliefs that we put together in our mind. And we so want to marry ourselves to these beliefs, especially if there's been something that has happened that has proved to us that, you know, that we feel has hurt us, that has traumatized us. Whatever belief we form around it, we want to hang on to it so tight. And the interesting thing about the work is it shines a light on the fact that a lot of the times with these beliefs, they come with a should or a shouldn't. 
And what I love about what Byron Katie talks about is uh, how there is no should or shouldn't because there is what is and that's it. You know, she, she, I was listening to, um, and she's got a lot of stuff on YouTube. If you listen on, on YouTube as well. And she was doing the work. She was facilitating it with someone who her husband had passed away and she was angry that her husband had passed away. And she, she talked about one of her statements about it was that he shouldn't have passed away. And she said, you can't say that he shouldn't have passed away because he did pass away. Like there's no such thing as like, it shouldn't have happened. You're in an argument with reality. You're in an argument with what is, and that's insanity, right? That this should not happen when it happens all the time. When we have a complaint about something or the, their behavior, or what, what someone's doing that, that doesn't work for us, that we feel doesn't work for us, they shouldn't be doing it. They're supposed to do this. They need to do that. You know, we put these, we cast these judgments on the people in our lives, on, on the people that we're in relationship with. And it's insane because it, it's in existence. So it, of course they should be doing it because it exists. It may not be morally right. It may not be what we'd prefer they be doing, but the should and the shouldn't and the argument with should and shouldn't it will is enough to drive you insane because it will have you depressed. You know, like when we're a perfectionist and we have a lot of should and shouldn'ts for ourselves, like I should do this and I should be here. I always call it shooting all over yourself. I should have this. I should have gotten, you know, this accolade. I should have achieved this level in my career. I used to do that to myself a lot when I worked in television. I should have... Um, you know, gotten this job, I should have won an Emmy, I should have this, I should have that. And all of those shoulds were reasons for me to then beat myself up and think that I was not good enough and go into my imposter syndrome because I was in a fight, in a fight with what was reality and what was really going on. And, you know, I think a lot of times we shouldn't ourselves a lot, let's say when it comes to sex, people we have sex with, so, you know, a lot of times as women and, you know, I guess men too, but sp- speaking to women specifically, because that's, you know, who I talk to when I do my group circles, we get into sexual entanglements with people that we didn't necessarily want to do that as quickly. Or, you know, we, we give our hearts, not all the time. I'm not saying a woman can't have casual sex, but more often than not. We're in a situation where we've given more physically than we plan to, or we've given more physically than the relationship warranted. And we were hoping, we were attached, hoping that something great was going to come out of it. And so we should, shouldn't ourselves, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't, it just, it was wrong. Now I'm shaming myself. So in the space of, I shouldn't, believing that that's true, that I've done something wrong, I have a way of behaving that just doesn't work for relationships. So then I got to clean it up somehow, or I got to fix it, or I got to let the person know that that's not how I normally am, especially if I really have feelings for that person. I have to like, you know, somehow gain their respect back. And if you've ever been in that position, and I have, where you've lost the respect of a man, maybe for sexual reasons, or maybe because he wasn't interested in a long-term relationship to begin with, If you've ever been in that situation where you're fighting to get their respect back, you're definitely putting yourself, oh my goodness, my love, my honey, you're definitely putting yourself in a situation of just insanity that will drive you crazy because it's not anything you can ever change. You know, once a man loses respect, you know, once anyone loses respect for another person, you really can't change, you know, people's perspectives because they're in their own should and shouldn't story, right? So that's another great thing about this work is it just gets you out of that headspace of like what should and shouldn't be <clears throat> and then making judgments, judgments on people about what should or shouldn't be. I was uh, watching some of uh, Byron Katie on YouTube today and she was having a conversation with someone and she was talking about how, you know, we make these judgments about the people in our lives And that starts a snowball of, you know, an avalanche of thoughts about them based on what we think they should or should not be doing. And then we find ourselves maybe angry with them, you know, feeling some sort of negative way, needing an apology from them, needing to forgive them. And all based on our perceptions and our thoughts and what we've decided about them, what we believe, what we perceive about who they are. 
So, you know, I, I could talk this to death, but without actually doing it, it's really hard to understand the concept. Before we do it, though, there are a couple things that I want to talk about and just break down because I think that when it comes to this work, this personal growth work, this deep diving emotional stuff, a lot of times we avoid it. I know I did. I avoided it for a very long time. Um, You know, like I just would read the books and I would be in my own little bubble about it. I would be, you know, watching my videos, you know, whether it was on YouTube or whatever, reading all the books I could get my hands on, but not really wanting to engage with anyone else around my growth, not really wanting to, um, not having a clear understanding of how you start to put it into practice in real life, you know, that sort of thing. I think we, we tend to avoid it because there's pain, there's past pain, you know, that we believe, we we have beliefs around, you know, having been traumatized and victimized and, you know, we're telling ourselves a story over and over again that makes it that if I'm expressing my emotions or dealing with any of it, it's going to be too much for me. I would rather just drink it away or eat it away. I would rather veg out in front of the television, be addicted to my phone, do anything else besides actually be focused on my own healing. And I'll tell you that this work is not for the faint of heart. It really isn't, my sweetheart, my love. To face down our emotions and our pain and our wellness and really do the deep diving stuff, especially for those of us who are out here, you know, type A, independent, strong ass women who are, in, you know, we don't need anybody to do it for us. There's, there's many of us out here. We don't need anybody to put a roof over our heads. We don't need anybody to, um, for us to survive. We might need help every now and then, but for the most part, it's not something we usually ask for. I have so many friends. I have a very close friend who she just Ah, oh, she's just so fiercely independent and there's nothing wrong with independence, but she, she's so solitary in it. So solitary, so clearly lonely and living alone doesn't dictate loneliness, but you can tell when someone has such a high level of perfectionism when it comes to themselves and the people around them, that they can't even be with other people. They wouldn't be able to live with somebody else because nobody living with them would be good enough. And I know that feeling because I went through my own stage of life where I felt like that, where it just, you know, I, I just had a, a critic, critic, or a comment or a judgment on everything. And, you know, I had one bad roommate after another because it just, it was never good enough. Me not knowing that that never good enough story was my own story. But I say all of that to say, we get into these things where it's like, you know, and this friend that I'm talking about, you know, she's a regular church goer. She goes to church every Sunday. She considers herself spiritual, but still beats up on herself so harshly that she can't be in relationship with anybody else. Great clothes, great apartment, great everything, but so hard on herself, right? And so we find ourselves in that so often where we put things in place where on the outside, it just all looks so good, right? It looks like we just got it all together. Great vacations, fantastic clothing. You know, we we can brush our hair when we have hair you guys know I don't have any hair we can brush our hair and put on some lipstick and you know look good and everybody's fooled into thinking that we're that fabulous independent woman and we got it all together and meanwhile we're pushing away and denying that deep work that deep level emotional work because we think it's going to be too much drinking a whole lot of wine just you know doing whatever we can maybe we're we're doing like all the what I call this the the pseudo wellness stuff, which this is not to take away from any of the little self care things that we do because they're lovely, you know, sitting in sweat lodges and going to ashrams and, you know, getting massages and acupuncture. Those all, those things are fantastic. They're wonderful. But, you know, a lot of times as type A independent women, we get to be junkies for that stuff because they're little glimpses of transformation without actually having to do the full emotional work. I might sit in a sweat lodge and end up in tears for a while and feel like, oh, I've cleansed everything. Meanwhile, I haven't really faced the beliefs. I haven't really transformed any of the beliefs. I just allowed myself to sit and cry some tears or or express some emotions. 
And that's kind of what that stuff is. It's like the the short term, you know, growth junkie fix that. I mean, you know, let me not judge. Uh, who knows what's going to be the, the trigger or the thing that has you do your your big emotional work. But to do the real stuff where you're just you're talking about it and it's real and you're allowing yourself to transform your thoughts about it and you're not insistent that the way I perceive it and the way I feel about it is a fact. And then I then have to navigate the world based on this fact that is actually a belief. That is the real work. That's the scary work that a lot of us are out here trying to avoid, right? A lot of us are out here just trying not to go there. And I get it because I've been that person. And up until even very recently have been that person because it's, a, it's an ongoing journey. And just a couple of days ago, I did this work not just with my group, but on my own. And I had some stuff to release around, you know, someone who's close to me and I've, and I got released from it. And you know what? My lower back eased up. I wasn't so stiff and tight and stressed out. Everything loosened. You know, I, like I said, I facilitated this with the Epic Circle the other night and, you know, they were having things like headaches, stiff necks, all that stuff went away through the course of doing the exercise and they all testified to it. Right. So this stuff, it's hard and it's scary. But when we don't deal with it, what it does is it just eats away at us. It eats away at our soul. It it causes sickness. It brings disease. And so that's why we do it. There's some other reasons that I, you know, little notes that I wrote down about why to do it, why to bother to do this work. To clear the longstanding resentments. Like we don't understand, I don't think, that the resentments destroy our earthly experience. I think that we think that, you know, I'm not sure what we generally think that we're here for when we let resentment rule our behavior. You know, when we stop speaking to people, when we treat people badly, when we make decisions about people and, and react to them and behave in a way out of the decision that we've made and expect them to understand and apologize and to understand that, that they've victimized us. And we put all the responsibility for whatever choices we make on them because of what they've done. Those long standing things that we hold on to. A lot of times, you know, I had a lot around my mother. I had a lot around my father. I had to do a lot of forgiveness work for both of them, you know, and people in my family and stuff like that. And friends, you know, I always talk about I used to be an emotional serial killer. Like you could only go so, like, like I'm one of those people. It takes a lot to make me angry. But if you made me angry, that was it. Boom, we're done. You know, and those, it's those things that kind of get stuck that clog up the works. That then, you know, they inform our beliefs and have us behaving in a way in our in our further relationships that just don't work. So what that's part of why we do this work is to clear that stuff out of the way. It doesn't need to be there. You don't have to walk around with a headache because you're trying to control things around you because you got all these resentments and people that you can't talk to, deal with, or whatever. You don't have to walk around trying to control everybody around you. So they won't hurt you or they won't behave away or, you know, whatever. Another reason that we do this work is to open our hearts up to intimacy. Right. So after all of the trauma and our histories, you know, they condition us into putting up these walls. Like I was talking about the walls, the boundaries, the blocks. We need something to inspire us to take them down or it will never happen. My client that I was talking about earlier with the boundaries, 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 she's, I love her so much with all my heart. She's one of my favorites. And one of the things she got to on Monday was that she's going to have to be the one to take the boundaries down if she wants the deep level intimacy, because she's the only one who can do it, right? But it's hard to do it. It's a hard thing to do. You know, like it, there's... There's, there's no there's no getting around that. It's scary. And that's like what I was talking about. It's why we avoid it, because we're afraid of it. You know, and we've been told and we believe that crying your tears, facing your fears, admitting you're wrong, all of that stuff, that it's it's hard work. That's what we say. It's hard work. It's too much. That's why we think relationships are hard work. 
I'm going to have to humble myself. That's too hard. I'm going to have to admit I might be wrong. I'm going to have to look stupid sometimes. That's hard. Woo, child, that's hard. I'm going to have to look like I don't know what I'm talking about sometimes. Woo! Don't nobody want to do that. Right? So that's another reason we do this work is to open our hearts up to the intimacy. That's my dog shaking it out. Oh, you're shaking it out. He's such a good puppy. Speaking of opening your heart to intimacy, ah, oh, this is a foster fail. I love this dog so much. He's so cute. I wish you could see him through the audio. He's so cute. But yeah, we want to open our hearts up to intimacy, right? So all the boundaries and the blocks, they don't work. We do this work so that we don't have to have all these boundaries and blocks. And believe it or not, you don't have to walk around with boundaries and blocks. You really don't. I know it seems like the world is crazy and the world is unsafe and, you know, the world is this and that, but you really don't have to walk around with boundaries and blocks all the time. Um, Another reason we do this work is just for our general wellness and our lifespan. Emotional freedom is like an internal wellness spa. All that stuff that we're trying to do on the outside to do self-care and like, you know, slough our skin and, you know, whatever, all the different methods. And don't get me wrong, I do enjoy a little spa treatment. There's nothing wrong with that. But all of that stuff that we're trying to do on the outside to sort of handle all of it and trying to like, you know, make it better from the outside. When we do this work, you're starting from the inside out. And even though growth is a journey and it's an ongoing journey, there's nothing more cleansing than starting from the inside out. There's nothing more freeing. And you do get to to experience a level of real freedom. And I can tell you, like, that's, you know, what I was talking about at the top of the show. Like, I honestly, there's definitely been times in my life where I've made a hell of a lot more money. There's definitely times in my life where I could just get on a plane and, you know, fly wherever I wanted to go to. Times in my life where I was having amazing sex. Goes this dude I I hooked up with for a while. I used to call him Big Dick Vic. Hopefully he's not listening. But things like that, like, you know, there are definitely times where the outside external things were great. But nothing feels better than emotional freedom. Nothing feels better than being on the other side of going going ahead and jumping in and doing this work. And I'm not saying this from a place of I'm done because you're never done. This is life. You never get it done. We're constantly growing. We're constantly moving to the next level of what needs to be uh, looked at, what challenges are facing us, what life is throwing at us to allow us to uh, explore and play with and grow and even when it feels like it's awful and traumatic, what life does to give us a chance to to maneuver around it, show who we can be in life, um, you know, let it inspire our creativity. Like, that's what we're here for. No one ever promised us that this life, this being on earth was going to be some easy thing, that it was supposed to be easy, that there would never be any racism or hatred, that there would never be any problems or sickness. No one ever promised uh, that, that this life on earth was supposed to be some breeze. But yet when it's not a breeze, when it's not what we want it to be, it, it's just, it can be so stopping and so devastating for us because we're in that argument with what is. We so badly don't want it to be because it's not what we want it to be. And so that's how we create our own loop of insanity. That's how we create our own depression. That's how we get into these, these places where we have to drink to make it better because we don't want to accept that life is what life is. Right. So that's another reason to do the work for your wellness, your lifespan, because that that mental fight with with reality will have you so sick. It'll have you check me out early. I can tell you my mother, she's a perfect example. Bless her heart. And I don't mean that in the southern fake way. I mean that in the real way. Bless her heart with all of my love. You know, she has dementia. And, you know, she definitely dementia is a disease of checking out. And good for her that she found a way to do it. Her brain, her brain is helping her to survive. Her brain is helping her to stay in the world in, in, a, in a time, in a place that she's not happy by having her check out. So she's not connected with reality, right? 
she wasn't happy about aging. She wasn't happy about, you know, yeah, a lot of people aren't happy about aging, but she wasn't happy about a lot of things having to do with us. She was always a perfectionist. She was always very hard on herself. Never was an example of self-love. That was something that I had to go and figure out for myself because she, she didn't know how to be an example of that. And so as she got older, life got harder and the people around her did what she wanted them to do less and less. There wasn't anything that you could do to satisfy it because as she got older, that that syndrome that everybody's got to be doing what I want them to do just got stronger and stronger and stronger. And in that fight with the reality that it's not what I think it should be, her brain, her body decided to take care of her by shutting down the connection with reality. So now she's she's in dementia. She's in the full throes of dementia. Now, I say that not saying, you know, in a lot of ways, there's some blessing in that because she doesn't have to suffer like she suffered before. But when we're younger and we're at a place where we could do this work so that we don't have to be a slave to our beliefs, so that we don't have to be a slave to what we feel like is wrong, when we're in a place where it's still possible to do that, a lot of times we can avoid those kinds of sicknesses and diseases. A lot of times we can avoid the way the body shuts down from stress because we're so stressed out in our fight with reality. That's a good reason to do this work, right? Here's another reason, because it feels good to do it. And why not be focused on what feels good? We're often so focused on like all the negative ills of the world, right? Especially with the internet and the news and all the things that we see and hear. It feels really good to do do deep emotional work. And this work that Byron Katie does, it's just so genius. Like it's just, it's miraculous and it's magical. And it's just really about willingness, right? In such a big way. And so why not? Why not feel good if you can feel good? You know, I know so many people, I feel like that the default setting is complaint, Or the default setting is unhappiness. I don't feel good. Life doesn't look good. I sit around and watch the news so things seem even more terrible. Um, You know, just downtrodden. And I know we could focus on a lot of things. It's so easy in this world. We get inundated all the time with all the negative things that are going on. But we never get inundated with all the amazing things that still go on in the world and how amazing the world actually is. So it's really hard to even fathom that just as as much good things happen as bad things happen, that there is a great balance to the world, that the world is miraculous and beautiful and all of that stuff. But being able to do this work lets you know that a lot of what we, we take in and perceive is just perception. It's just that. It's not real. It's not real. What's in the past doesn't exist anymore and the future doesn't exist either because it hasn't happened. All we have is right now, right? So it, it releases us from that, being a slave to what's not real. And another reason to do it is that, like I said, it's why we are here on earth. We are here on earth to do this work. We are here on this earth to connect with each other, to understand each other, to go through our ups and downs, to allow our challenges to to inspire us, to sometimes not be able to do that, to sometimes just stay in bed and figure out what that means. We are here on earth to explore the earth, to um, just go through all of it. And all of it is perfect. All of it is perfect. Even the stuff that we hate, it's exactly what we need to be doing or need to be enduring or going through in order to have us experience what we came here for, right? And that's different for everybody. So those are some reasons why I believe this work is so important. And hopefully, you know, I've maybe convinced you, maybe, Maybe it sounds more appealing. I get a little intense about it. You know, just to consider, like, you know, have I been doing my work? Have I been taking care of myself? And I talk about self-love so often. You guys who listen regularly, you know. Have I been loving myself enough and taking care of myself enough that I am doing this work and allowing myself to grow and allowing myself to feel? I was in a women's healing circle a few years ago. My mentor, who I still love very much and still follow and you know try to work with when I can 
And in that circle that she facilitated, I got to get so much healing around miscarriages and my relationship with my mother and so many tears that needed to be cried and words that needed to be said, communication that needed to be had that I was bottling up and holding back on because I, I, I let my beliefs make me think that it was just too hard for me to do and it wasn't worth it. And so I walked around with all the resentments and the negative thoughts feeling like I was justified. I had a right to feel this way and see it this way and think this way. Meanwhile, it was killing me. It was hurting me. It was, you know, I was in pain all the time. I had all kinds of problems with my lower back, all kinds of problems with my digestive system. And when I start having those problems, I know something's going on with me mentally. You guys have been listening, you know, a couple shows ago, I talked about flow. I think it was just the last show I talked about flow and the importance of flow and how our thoughts, you know, are sort of the, the seedlings for disease, right? I'm not going to keep preaching about that, but here's the thing. This work, the work, I wanted to introduce you guys to it because whether you come and and join us in the circle, I don't always do it in the circle, only sometimes. Um, I actually just introduced it to the circle or just go and do it on your own. I think it's thework.org. It's free to do. Um, You know, I want to introduce you guys to this because it's part of the miracle that started me on my growth journey. And it's a big part of what's going on with me now because I reconnected with it. And, you know, just as much then and as now, it's caused a lot of uh, understanding, healing for me and, you know, just any sort of release of feeling like people should, shouldn't, are supposed to or need to be doing things around me that aren't doing them. You know, any sort of fight with what is reality, any sort of fight with my, uh, my perception, my interpretation of how life is supposed to be. Of course, the German Shepherd is now making noise because he's pulling all his toys out. Anyway, so let me tell you about this work. There's there's three very important parts to it. This hour goes by so fast. So the first thing that, that Byron Katie has us do is to write down statements. And it's they're guided statements. So, um, you know, I facilitated it last Monday. What I had everybody do, I set a timer. And so I went through the different guides. So the first statements, and you can do more than one statement around each of these, these guides. So the first one is, in the situation, who angers, confuses, hurts, saddens, or disappoints you, and why? Right. So the example that that uh, Byron Katie gives is I am angry with Paul because he lied to me. Right. So if you have any of that, if you have someone in your life, I am angry with so and so because blank, blank, blank. I am sad uh, or disappointed with whoever because blank, blank, blank. You, you know, you want to write down as many of those statements as you can about one particular person. It's, it's better to do it around one person at a time because it makes more sense. So in this situation, who angers, confuses, hurts, saddens, or disappoints you and why? Number two guide. These are your wants in the situation. How do you want him or her to change? What do you want him or her to, her to do? So I want blank to blank. I want Paul to see that he's wrong and I want him to stop lying to me. I want him to you know, come home earlier. I want him to whatever, 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 you know, you want from this person that you've been desiring for this person to do. So you get to just write all those down in number two. And, uh, Katie invites people to be, people call her Katie, um, as judgmental as they want to be like, don't try to be evolved. You know, those of you who listen regularly, a lot of you are already in the personal growth conversation, but you don't have to try to be evolved while you write these statements down. Be as judgmental as you want to be, because that's part of what fosters your healing, right? Just be honest. Number three, guide. And what advice would you offer this person, right? So he should, here comes the shoulds and shouldn'ts. Paul shouldn't frighten me with his behavior. Paul should take a deep breath. Paul should understand that I love him. Paul should stop acting like this. Paul should, you know, whoever is your person. And we don't know who Paul is either. We just made up Paul. Katie always uses Paul. Number four, what are your needs? So in order for you to be happy in this situation, what do you need this person to think, say, feel, or do? I need, and these are different than your wants. Because when you say I need it, like I need it in order for me to be okay. I need this in order for me to, you know, move forward with this relationship. I need this in order for me to be happy. 
So I need Paul to stop talking over me. I need for him to really listen to me. I need to work this problem out or for him to work this problem out. So, you know, write down all those judgments. And number five is your complaints. So what do you think of him or her in this situation? And make a list. Katie says it's okay to be petty and judgmental. So their name blank is blank. So she uses as an example, Paul is a liar. Paul is arrogant. Paul is loud. Paul is dishonest. Paul is unconscious. I had a great, um, one of my other fantastic clients who I love so, so, so much, who's in the group, you know, for her, she was saying that her person was disrespectful. And so we got to do so much work around disrespectful. And what we got to discover was that there was a belief around his disrespect that had her doing the things that she didn't want him to do, but expecting him not to do them, even though she had her own way of doing them. And that's what we do as human beings, because she wasn't wrong, but she got to discover that they were just in a battle with their different ways of doing the same thing, which was manipulating and controlling each other, that she would not have necessarily discovered without this work. So number six is what is it about this person and situation that you don't ever want to experience again? So you get to write down the statements of what you don't ever want to experience again. I don't ever want whatever behavior action again. I don't ever want Paul to lie to me again. I don't ever want to be disrespected again. The next thing to do is to question each of your statements. And this could take a long time, but you know, you go through and question each of them. And she gives the four questions. Is it true? If you insist that, yes, the statement is true, you have to ask yourself, can you really know it's 100% true? Not that that I'm saying it's not true, not saying that you're a liar, but just question. Can I really say, you know, like my client the other day, she's disrespectful. Well, is that 100% true? Is that all he is is disrespectful? Because many of us have different facets to our, our personality and we can be disrespectful, but there's other things that go on as well. Was he always disrespectful? Like we have to look at, is this belief about this person true, right? Or is it 100% true? Do I have proof that it's 100% true? And so then who do I have to be while I think that the thought is true? So while I'm thinking the thought is true, if I feel like the person is disrespectful, I got to be defensive. I got to be ready to, you know, and she mentioned some things that she does, hang up the phone. I got to be willing to either fight back or to ignore this person, I got to be willing to do disrespectful things, right? Through the thought that this person is disrespectful. So I'm basically doing the same thing they're doing. But who do you get to be, question number four, if you didn't believe the thought was true? Well, if I don't see you as disrespectful, if I, if I, you know, and this is not to ruin your perception or anything like that, but if I don't choose to take on that belief and I choose to just stay in alignment with who I am, then your disrespect or whatever I'm perceiving it as, I'm impervious to it. It means nothing to me, right? So I don't have to be at the, at the consequence of your behavior. I don't have to respond to that kind of behavior if, if I'm not you know, sitting in that belief about you. I can just treat you however I feel like is in alignment with who I authentically am. And that's one thing I think we're afraid of because authentically... A majority of us, deep down inside, we just want the love and connection. We just want to be loving and sweet. That's who we want to be. But so often we guard that because we're so busy trying to combat someone else's bad behavior. And so we get stuck into this cycle where we're doing the exact thing that we're accusing the other person of doing, and we're out of alignment with who we get to be or who we really want to be, authentically want to be. And that's the most powerful that we can ever be. That loving, authentic self who says, I just want to be loved and connect and connected. No one's going to hurt you through that, even though we feel like they are. Because so many times we put on airs, we put on this show of, of wanting love and connection. We acted nice. We tried to do all the things we could to make that person love us. And it didn't work. We got rejected. So we told ourselves a story. Well, when I'm loving and I'm nice, that doesn't work because then mean people will take advantage of me. And no, when you're loving from a place of authentic self-love aligned with who you are, really loving yourself and trusting in that and coming from a place of honesty and straight about it, you're not compromising yourself. You're not attached to what someone else can do for you. You're not trying to force anybody to do anything. There's no room for any disappointment. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen, right? 
So, okay, so that's part two of the work. And it's called, she calls it the inquisition. And then you do, you get to do the turnaround sentence, sentence, sentences. And this is where you just get to try on alternatives to what you believe is the truth. So if the statement is, Paul doesn't listen to me, and I've done the inquisition about it, and I know that if, if I'm thinking he doesn't listen to me, then that means I got to talk louder. I got to um, ignore him back or I got to fight for it. But if I get to be who I want to be, I know that all I have to do is say my piece and he's either going to get it or he's not going to get it. But I don't have to fight. I don't have to be there. You know, I can just be who I want to be. I can be free. I don't need his approval. I don't need him to listen to me. Right. But when I turn it around, turn the statements around, so Paul doesn't listen to me, and opposite to that is, I don't listen to myself. I don't listen to myself. I'm so worried about Paul hearing me and Paul doing what I want him to do around it that I don't give myself the respect and the honor of knowing that what it is that I have to say is important. I need his validation. I'm fighting for it. That's one interpretation. So another turnaround could be, you you know, you with them. I don't listen to Paul. So while Paul's not listening to me, I'm not going to listen to him. So what does that make me in the situation? A participant in the insanity, right? I'm going faster because you guys know this hour goes so fast. So the third turnaround, a third possible turnaround is the complete opposite s- sentence. Paul does listen to me. And so a lot of times when we've been believing a statement, it's really hard to turn it around and then, you know, really try that on and think about what that really feels like and what that could be and what we can discover. But I want to invite you to go to the work.org and do this work. And if you find yourself doing it alone and, you know, please, by all means, come and join us in the Epic Circle. Because in the Epic Circle, we don't do it all the time. We did it last week. We might do some more of it. This Actually, we are going to do some more of it this Monday. Um, you know, but we do that. We do other, like also do hypnotherapy during the circle. There's a full curriculum. We heal and we support each other and we love each other and we have a lot of fun. It's an online healing circle for women everywhere every Monday night. And we, as women come together as a community, we cause personal transformation when it comes to communication, forgiveness, self-love, mother, daughter relationships, purpose, friendship, and just all the tools that we need to be as big as we were meant to be. Right, we just started collective number two, but you can jump on, jump in at any time. The first class is completely free, and um, if you want to find out more, go to our meetup page. Go on to meetup.com and go to the Epic Circle. Join us, join us, join us. Next week, I will be back with my broadcasting partner Brian from Celebrity Magazine. We will be back live, large, and in charge. Follow us on Instagram at Ask for Candy Podcast at Candy Love Coach. I'm more active on at Candy Love Coach, but I'm trying to get my Instagram game back together. I've been kind of slow. And at Celebrity Magazine. Again, you can email me, Ask for Candy Podcast at gmail.com. I hate that we always have to rush through, but join us, the Epic Circle Meetup. We'll actually do this work for real. I do it real coaching with it, real facilitation. And, um, you know, like I said, some other work as well. But that is it. I love you guys so much for listening. I appreciate you. I love having you. And what do you want to say, German Shepherd? Oh, the dog, he's looking at me after he farted through my whole podcast. Anyway, until next time, never forget you are a love machine. If you ever start to feel like you aren't getting the love you need, just make more and then ask for candy, honey. Yeah.